Hello, my most holy of followers, and welcome back to the Celestial Perch. Today, I have a new Civic Deep Dive. This one will be slightly different from the ones in the past, as rather than having one Civic per video, which I realize probably wouldn't be very sustainable moving into the future, considering just how many Civics there are in Stellaris, even within the regular biological empires, it just wasn't feasible for me to do one per video. So I'm going to be combining these into uh, sort of groups based loosely on either just what makes the most sense to me thematically or what kind of makes the most sense for gameplay. In this case, we're going to be kind of going more so for theme, a militaristic theme, and we'll be looking at both nationalistic zeal and citizen service. But without wasting any more time, let's dive in and look at both civics. Now, I'm going to keep the structure very similar. We're just going to start out with a basic overview of what both the civics do, and then we will dive back into nationalist zeal, go over it a lot more in depth, do the same thing with citizen service, and then I will take a look at both civics and how they rate within single player and multiplayer. And lastly, I will go over just my overall thoughts and what I might do to adjust the civics if they need it. But that should go over all the structure and we can dive into just the overviews. Now, looking at nationalist zeal first, Man, oh man, this is a boring Civic. It reduces our war exhaustion gain by 20% and reduces our claim influence cost by 15%. It also requires us to be some degree of militarist. Now, going over war exhaustion first, this will go from 0% to 100% and will measure the total war weariness or just general attrition suffered by both empires during the war and it's affected by your losses during space combat, ground warfare, destruction of planets, and just a passive accumulation over time. When a side's war exhaustion hits 100%, they can be forced into a status quo piece, and if both sides hit 100%, then you'll be forced into status quo after 24 months regardless. Now there are several ways to reduce war exhaustion gain, also nationalistic zeal, of course, there are other civics, there are technologies, diplomatic stance, the Gestalt Consciousness ethic, as well as several war resolutions being the rules of war, the never surrender tradition within the unyielding tree, and the most impactful being the crisis level 2. In terms of war exhaustion and how it actually affects your gameplay, it won't actually impact what you can receive at the end of the war. You can win a war at 98% war exhaustion or 14% war exhaustion and get the same exact benefit that you would regardless of what your war exhaustion is. So it is something to keep in mind, but for the vast majority of players, it's just something that if you stay in the war too long, you will eventually be forced into status quo or both players be forced into status quo after the previously mentioned 24 month period. Now, looking at Nationalist Exile's second bonus, they get a minus 15% claim influence cost, and within Stellaris, claims work in a way that as long as you have the unrestricted wars philosophy, you can make any claim on a non-federation member. So if somebody owns a system that you want, you can make a claim on it. You can make multiple claims on the same system to have a stronger claim. In the event that both empires have declared war on the same empire and take over a system, the empire with the most claims will take the system. If there is the same amount of claims, it will go to the older empire. So just keep that in mind when you're making claims. And there are several factors that will increase or reduce the cost of a claim. A claim has a base cost of 50 influence, as shown here on the screen, with extra additive costs, additive multipliers, and finally, a rival multiplier as well. If the modifier reaches a total of minus 100%, then the claim will become zero, allowing you to make as many claims as you want. And that should be it for nationalistic zeal. Looking more so at citizen service, we have four unique benefits, a lot more than nationalistic zeal. We get two unity from our soldier jobs. We get 15% naval capacity. We can construct the recruitment office holding. And lastly, full citizenship pops must have full military service and vice versa. Now we're going to start from the top and work our way down. So getting two unity from our soldier jobs 
We can see here on the screen that soldier jobs will give us four naval capacity, six with a ground defense planning, a technology you can get relatively early. It will also provide us with three planetary defense armies and five stability if we are under the martial law modifier. And of course, plus two unity with our citizen service civic. Now, initially comparing this to something like a bureaucrat or priest, you are regrettably lacking in unity production or unity and amenities production. So soldiers wouldn't necessarily replace those jobs. It's just they become slightly better versions of soldiers. You would never build a fortress world and expect it to be on par with a administrative center or ecclesiastical center. It's just that building that fortress world, it will also slightly augment your unity. But looking at their other benefit here, we get 15% naval capacity. Looking at naval capacity, it's actually relatively simple. It just represents the number of military ships that an empire can effectively support. So going beyond it, it doesn't actually reduce the amount of ships you can build if you go beyond it. It doesn't prevent you from building more ships than your naval capacity. It just simply will increase the maintenance cost by a percentage proportional to the exceeded capacity. So if an empire exceeds its naval capacity by 50%, it will increase the maintenance cost by 50%. Each ship will have a base maintenance cost increased by the armor, shields, weapons, utility slots attached to it, and then also increased by the exceeded naval capacity. Now, the last thing to look at would be the holding, the recruitment office. Building one of these will give us 10 naval cap, as well as two recruiter jobs on that planet. These recruiter jobs are kind of interesting, as for any uh, non-Gestalt subject uh, with uh, Pop Species citizenship in the Overlord's Empire, there's a 20% chance a Pop will migrate to the capital every five years by event. Relatively small, but still kind of interesting. And the subject will receive three planetary defense armies per job. And the last sort of benefit, more so just for flavor, is that full citizenship Pops must have full military service and vice versa doesn't really affect too much of your gameplay. It's more just there for flavor, the I'm doing my part kind of flavor. But now that we've gone over all of those, we can look at nationalistic zeal and citizen service, both within the lens of single player and multiplayer, and give them their respective ratings on the A to F scale. And then after that, if there are any kind of adjustments or improvements to the civics that I would recommend, I'll go over that, and then we can wrap up the video. Let's jump in first to Nationalistic Zeal. So, looking at Nationalistic Zeal in a single player lens, it's technically playable, it's just kind of pushing it in the sense that it really probably only falls into either a more roleplay sense or if you're trying to maybe get to those zero influence claims. Those are really the only two situations in which case I would recommend using Nationalistic Zeal. It, it lacks quite a bit. There's no major early economic bonus, so you're not going to be taking this as one of your first civics. It's not really truly going to help you out during war as much as you'd think. Yes, you get the negative 20% war exhaustion gain. It's just even in single player most of the time, if you're losing versus the AI, the AI is going to be doing either subjugation wars if they do not have access to total war, or they're going to be doing total war. And for subjugation wars, if you think you're going to lose, you can just instantly surrender, become their vassal, build back up, and fight a war for your freedom. Or if it's total war, you're just dead. So the war exhaustion gain won't help you there too much. And on the offensive, you shouldn't be gaining too much war exhaustion anyways. And then the other side of things being the claim influence. Influence, although still useful, unity has taken over a lot of that role. And really the only two major uses for influence are building your early star bases, negotiating vassal contracts, and building a select few megastructures. It's just that you might not necessarily need even nationalist exile to get to those zero influence claims. So it sort of runs into two issues being one, it's not really something that you can take advantage of easily. And when you do manage to take advantage of it, it's not really that powerful. And looking at multiplayer, it runs into those issues but is further exacerbated by the fact that it's multiplayer. And if you're taking something as weak as Nationalist Exile, it's going to put you back significantly. 
and the war exhaustion gain, generally speaking, will not be useful at any point in the game, as if you're winning, you're going to be winning very quickly, and if you're losing, you're going to be losing very quickly. Even if you are dragged into a war that takes a long, long time, the worst thing that's going to happen is status quo, and as long as you're prepared, or at least playing around that, you should be okay. Likewise, the claims influence cost, not as useful as you'd expect, as a lot of the war goals that are going to be seen would be subsidiary or subjugation war goals where you're trying to make someone a vassal or you just claim a few specific systems as these multiplayer lobbies tend to be crowded and you're not going to be needing to claim 20 30 systems maybe just four or five would do in which case you don't need to save that 15 percent it's just not really going to cut it so for single player i'm going to give nationals exile a d plus it's just lacking and doesn't really have enough oomph to really make the cut. And for multiplayer, I'm going to give it just a basic F. Not going to be F+, plus. you know, it's not really even getting close to being D tier, but it's also not technically the worst Civic. You know, there's no actual downside to taking it beyond just the opportunity cost. It's not going to hurt you actively. Not, it's not going to make your gameplay harder. It's just not going to do very much at all. Now moving on to citizen service, a lot better here in single player and multiplayer, but starting with single player, I think it has its playstyle. You're trying to either take advantage of soldiers and get some unity off of them, in which case maybe rather than having one administrative center or ecclesiastical center, you just have maybe two or three fortress worlds and a much larger fleet. It's possible to play it, it might not be optimal, but it can be fun. As well, percent naval cap is just always good. There's nothing wrong with percent naval cap. The holding it gives you not exactly the best. Now you're probably not, it's probably not gonna be your first, second, or maybe even third holding, but it could fill in those third or fourth holdings if you happen to have four available, in which case maybe you take it. But overall, I think for single player, it fills its role. It gives you extra naval cap. It allows you to fuel the larger fleet, and it allows you to get a little bit of extra unity out of your soldiers which isn't too bad. Now, in the vein of multiplayer, it does have the same benefit. It's just you have to consider that it's probably not going to be one of your first picked civics, so it's going to be coming maybe sometime around your 30 or 40 when you're actually able to take advantage of that 15% naval cap, and it will be a lot more effective then than it will be at the start, but it still has that 15% naval cap, and being able to field more ships than your opponent is important. It can equate to just an economic benefit in the sense that you don't have to spend as much energy or that you're able to maintain a larger deficit than your opponents would as you just have 15% extra naval cap. And that can save you a lot of energy and just equate some more ships and more ships means you're more likely to win. So I think for citizen service, uh, for single player at least, it will land itself quite nicely in the A- minus tier. It has its power, naval cap's always good, as well if it's a rather nice roleplay build, and it's pretty easy to take advantage of overall. It's a passive benefit to both your soldiers and your naval cap. Uh, the holding isn't necessarily something you'll build maybe within your first two holdings, but it could fill that either third or fourth slot, which can be a benefit to you, just adding extra naval cap. For multiplayer, on the other hand, I would say probably more so in like the B to B plus territory. It's still good, don't get me wrong, 15% naval capacity is rather solid it's just it's going to find itself in a little bit more of a contest with other powerful military civics like distinguished admiralty whereas although yes you have additional naval cap compared to distinguished admiralty they will have higher fire rate so it really depends on how effectively are you able to use that additional naval cap a, lo a lot of the times for earlier fights it's going to boil down to just how many alloys you have so if you have 15,000 alloys and your opponent has 15,000 alloys going into your 30, 35, and you both build up fleets, you're going to be able to build the same amount of ships. It's just going to be who has higher fire rate, who has better fleet design. And if they have better fire rate than you, you might lose. So it could find itself into some builds. It will just depend. But it is powerful. You know, 15% naval cap is a percentage naval cap benefit. And considering there are plenty of ways to get flat naval cap, this uh, you know, I think it justifies the B to B plus tier. But before we wrap the video, I just want to go over, you know, do I think either Civic needs an adjustment or a buff? 
and I think the answer is clear for one of them and less so for the other. Were nationalist exile, I would say yes, more so because the Civic is just so boring. I don't think I've ever actually picked nationalist exile and been excited to play it or enjoyed playing with it. It's on the same tier of enjoyment as something like mining guilds, but at least mining guilds, you can feel the early game benefit, whereas nationalist exile, you might not ever feel that benefit or it might take so long that by the time you get there, it's completely worthless. So I feel like it needs just a little bit of extra oomph or flavor or something that ties it into that nationalistic zeal. So for me, if I was to rework it or give it, just add something else to it, maybe while you're at war, you could have citizen pop happiness or for the first five years of a war, you could have additional fire rate. Just something to encourage players to go to war as that's kind of what the Civic is designed for. On the other hand, with citizen service, I feel it's in a good place. It doesn't really necessarily need anything else. Maybe if you wanted it to be more of a contender within multiplayer, it could use a slight buff there. But I think for the vast majority of people in multiplayer, it's a fine Civic. And if you want to play with it and you're a good enough player, you can. It's, it's good enough. It fits plenty of playstyles and it has its power. So I don't necessarily think it needs a buff, but it could use maybe just a slight little adjustment or addition to it to maybe push it into the other tiers and would be taken a little bit more as a third Civic. But thank you for listening. And if you have any other video suggestions or ideas, please leave them below. But thank you and I hope you have a blessed day.